Hallelujah. Good. Let's everybody stand up for just a moment. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I want you just to lift your hands and start praying in the Spirit. Come on, we're just going to begin to engage Holy Spirit this morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> Father, we submit to you today. We declare we don't need to hear from a man. We need to hear from heaven. So speak to us by Holy Spirit today, Father. Father, we just declare our ears will hear what Holy Spirit is saying to the church. We thank you that this atmosphere, this room right now, Father, is engaged with heaven and nothing will hinder from heaven filling this room. We declare today, Father, that your kingdom is come and your will is being done right here in this room. So kingdom of God manifest in this place in Jesus' name. I just sense right now, Holy Spirit is healing you right now. You need healing, just lay your hand on where you need healing. <clears throat> Father, we release healing right now. Healing, healing balm of Calvary begin to flow right now. Every infirmity, every sickness, every disease has to go in Jesus' name. I just saw in the Spirit of the Lord healing someone's knees. Hallelujah. Joints are being healed right now in Jesus' name. Somebody came in today. You have a low-grade fever. God's healing that. Is. That thing is, is, is being pulled out of your body right now in the name of Jesus. Somebody's having problems, their nasal problems and problems in your sinuses, but it's also with the nose and the bones in the nose. God's healing you right now. I just release that, Father, into this room, into these people. Someone has a pain in the corner of their eye. God's healing that right now. Lord, I release that healing. Thank you, Father. Lord, we give you glory. We give you glory. We give you glory. We give you glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just give God a big praise right now. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. We're going to dive into this today. I got to put my my uh, electronic copy back together. I knew I needed to write this down so I could get this thing back together again. Perfect. Everybody good? Amen. There's some seats on the front if you're not afraid. <clears throat> if anybody wants them. Uh, our class today is on Kingdom Foundation. And... Uh, Brother in the sound booth, if I need to move around or move backwards to get out from under here, you, you just let me know what I need to do, and I'll make the adjustment. <clears throat> but y'all have had some pretty awesome teachers already this year. Alamo Beef 2, how many of y'all enjoyed Dr. Beef 2? Four of you did. I'll let him know. <laughs> Dwayne Miller, isn't Dwayne awesome? Yeah. Now, Dwayne and, and Dr. Beef, too, we'll be using them also 
in our school with foreign languages. That's what I'm going to call it because there's just too many of them coming forward. Apostle Jackie will be another one uh, if she accepts the assignment. Mission Impossible. If you will accept the assignment, this thing will explode. And <laughs> uh, and y'all have had Kerry Kirkwood. Yeah, he's pretty awesome, isn't he? He's a great man. And uh, you had Bob Long. Yeah, he's a miracle. If anybody, if, it, if God can use Bob Long, he can use anybody. A man who lived a lot of his life on acid. Isn't that amazing? I tell him, I said, Bob, it looks like at times when you're teaching, you're having flashbacks. <laughs> but I said, I decree over you, no flashbacks, flash forwards in Jesus' name. And uh, I love Bob. Bob is going to be helping us head up the College of Fivefold Ministry. And uh, that's going to be a lot of fun as well. And uh, many of you that are uh, here today, how many of you are actually Kingdom University students? Good, 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 good. Some of you are not. This is your opportunity to get in on what God's doing. Hallelujah. <laughs> I like to say it that way. Uh, but, yeah, you guys can get information uh, from the coordinators here. We'd, we'd be honored to have you a part of it. We're having our graduation and promotion uh, celebration conference in Nashville uh, this coming uh, November. Now, I'm just going to put some prayer requests out there if I could do that. We've had six venues booked for this event, and all of them cancel us two or three days after. So I'm, I know God's up to something. So we're looking for a couple other, at a couple other venues. And uh, I'm not even nervous about it. I've got a piece about it. Uh, we'll have Dutch there. Dutch Sheets will be there. Uh, Chuck Pierce will be there. Uh, we'll have Alamu Beef Two. He will be there. Tony Kemp. How many of you have heard of Tony Kemp? Has Tony been here? Y'all get him next round. Uh, Tony will be here. Be there with us. Uh, Dwayne. All of our teachers will be there. Jackie, I hope well, you'll be there, won't you? And yes, amen in the name of Jesus. Uh, yeah, that, that's going to be healed, praise God, in the name of Jesus. But we're hoping to get all of our teachers there. We, we, the Lord laid something on my heart a little bit different. Um, we have, of course, we'll have praise and worship. Jeremy Burke will be doing that. And uh, we'll have the Isaacs. They'll do some special music for us. Y'all ever heard of the Isaacs? Uh, and we're working with two other major artists. I don't want to give their names at the moment until they can confirm for us. One of them's a student of ours. Uh, to to come and to be able to do two or three songs before uh, the message comes forth in our evening services. But uh, I think this is going to be a phenomenal conference, graduation, and promotion during that time. I want us this morning to get started with a verse that we talked a little bit about last night. Now, Kingdom Foundation, when we talk about Kingdom Foundation, we are talking about something totally different than religion. And we're going to uproot religion a little bit more today. I know we got a hold of it a little bit last night. But we're going to deal with it a little, a little bit more today. And we're going to begin to see what the purpose of Jesus actually was. Now, I really wish we had seat belts in here this morning. I'm not too worried about this crowd. Some places we go, people, their eyes just get really big when we make a few statements. But... We're going to really see today the purpose of Jesus. Everybody say the purpose of Jesus. Well, I want us to go to 1 John chapter 3. We're going to go there first. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 3. We're going to look at verse, let me just back up to verse 4. We're going to focus it on verse 8, but I want us to go back four verses here to kind of get the entire picture. Now, if you recall, whenever we study the word, Kingdom You, we teach from the paradigm or from the perspective of we're asking who's talking who are they talking to number three what does it mean in that culture right then number four how do we take that and apply it into our life this is very important as we're reading the word of God so verse four everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness brothers there's a ringing in here that I'm getting can we pull it back just a little bit because I think I can project pretty good. We, I'll get the preacher, preacher going in me in a minute. 
everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. A couple things I want you to notice about this, very practical. Is the word sin here singular or plural? Say it loud. Singular. He who practices sin also practices lawlessness. You guys, come on in. Grab a seat here in the middle somewhere. We're all, we're all, this, I told people this is the prophetic zone today. Hallelujah. We're going to prophesy to some of you. <clears throat> but lawlessness is not tied into religion. Lawlessness is tied in to government. Everybody say government. And then it goes on to say, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. Or this word sin is plural here. It means commit the act of sin. It's not speaking of many sins. <clears throat> it goes on to say here, no one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children... Make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. We know the word righteous. It means right standing or right relationship. Amen? Now here's verse 8. Let's look at this very closely today. And I'm using the New American Standard. It says here, the one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for the, this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Let's read that, to, uh, let's read that again. I want us to read it together. Is this, the, this is the NASB here. Ready? Let's read. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. This is an amazing scripture whenever you begin to look at this through what we talked about a while ago. Who's talking? Who are they talking to? What did it mean in their culture? And then how do I take it and apply it to my life? Now we need, do I need to not be under, I need to be in front of it. Let me move forward. See, y'all thought y'all were getting out of the spit zone. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Is that better? Oh, good. See, when you got people that know what they're doing, that makes a big difference, doesn't it? So in verse 8, he's saying here, the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from when? Does that give us a reference point of what this verse is talking about? Amen? Now, the word sin here, we need to notice, is a singular word. It's not talking about sins that are plural. I said it last night. It's not talking about, you know, drinking, smoking, doping, spitting, chewing, or dating girls who do those things. <laughs> Amen. Come on, y'all smile at me on Saturday morning. We're going to have fun today. Amen? But it's talking about one singular sin that took place. So this word sin is singular. It says he is of the devil. Why? For the devil has sinned from the beginning. And the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Now we understand today, and we'll talk about it a little bit more <clears throat> later, but the sin in the beginning was in the garden, right? So when we're looking at this passage, we have to look at this original sin. Now, the word sin here, in the, it, it, we're looking at it and reading it in the Greek. And the word here in the Greek is failure. It is miss the mark. It's to con, con, commit an offense. It means to trespass or rebel. Everybody say rebel. Now the word sin in the Hebrew, it also means to miss. <clears throat> it means to go wrong, to forfeit. Listen to this. It means to indict, to be indicted, to trespass. The word sin in Hebrew, which is the word chata, it means to rebel. It means the act of treason. Man, that's good. 
See, when we understand what these words actually mean outside of the Western definition that they've been given, it makes a big difference. Why? Because religion has defined things for us in a way that we've not only lost the original meaning of these words, and, but we've also lost what they actually have contributed. So when we look at the word sin, it's not morality that we're talking about. Morality in the kingdom of God has to do with culture. All right, so whenever you get born again and you come into the kingdom, you're not, you're not being saved from all of your sins, plural. You're being saved from a sin, singular. A treasonous act, a rebellious act that took place in the beginning. That's what you're being saved from. Now the word saved, it does not mean ticket to heaven. We'll see this a little bit later but it means to be restored or to be recovered. So when we actually talk about being saved or being born again, we're not talking about I got my ticket to heaven or I bought fire insurance. No, 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 no. It's talking about I've been recovered and I've been restored. So when you restore something, you put it back into its original design. Does that make sense? I love old trucks. But I love old trucks that are restored like they came out of the factory. I don't like all these modified things where they chop the top and they lower it, you know, and that's just, that's almost an abomination to me. <clears throat> but I've got a 1976 Ford F100 4x4 that I'm in the process of restoring. It's going to look like it came out of the factory when I get done with it. It may take me 20 years, but it's going to be nice when I get it restored. Whenever you see the, the, the stem re in front of a word, it means to do it again or to put it back like it was, to, to run the cycle, to bring it back around to the way it was or, originally intended to, to be. When you look at this through the lenses of religion, and you say, I have been saved, you, you kind of go, all right, I'm not going to hell. That's the main thing religion has put in us. You want to skip eternity in hell and go to heaven. Well, you were never created for heaven. You were created for the earth. You didn't come from heaven. You were brought out of the earth. God formed you in the out of the earth. You're dirt. All of you are dirt. Hallelujah. Some of you are different colored dirt than other people, but we're all dirt. And just let me interject this here. You don't need to live your life by the color of your dirt. Testing one, two. Amen. The color of your dirt has nothing to do with your purpose. Amen. Because there's only one race, the human race. We've divided up a bunch of races, but there's no only one race. The human race, it just comes in many different dirt colors. We're all the same. Amen? And it only comes in two models, male and female. That's the only two models the human race comes in, male and female. Am I right? You remember Henry Ford said, you can get my car in any color you want as long as it's black. Y'all remember that? If you've never read quotes by Henry Ford, that's a good one to read. What does it mean? He said, I've only made my vehicles in one pattern that's in me. This is the way I want my vehicles. And, and the creator made the human race the same way. He made male and female. He didn't make transgenders. He didn't make, you know, transvestites. He didn't make queers. Yeah, he didn't make all of that. He made two models, male and female, and he put within them the same abilities that he had in him to create. And procreation is not just making a human. We have the ability to create an eternal spirit. Right? Whenever you were born, you, were, you became an eternal spirit, not just a body. So when we're looking at this event that happened in the garden, we're seeing there that this original sin was not morality. 
It was treason. Why? Because when God created Adam and Eve, and even before they, they came into existence, God said in, in the book of, uh, let's just go there, let's go to Genesis chapter 1. He said in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, He said, then God said, let us make man. That word man there in the Hebrew is Adam, Adam. And, it, and, and, and that is the name of our race. We are the Adamic race or the Adamic race, depending on what part of the south you're from. And uh, it means mankind in its totality. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, look at these next words. Let them rule. Everybody say rule. This word rule is the word in Hebrew, rada. Everybody say rada. The word rada, it means to have dominion. It means to dominate, to be the domineering one, to prevail, to kingdom. I think my mic keeps going off because we've entered into some shouting moments and it's just kind of flew right over our head. Why? Because the word rule is not a religious word. It's a governmental word. And when Adam failed, Adam did not lose a religion. He lost a government. Amen? Are you with me? Let me say that one more time. This really needs to penetrate us in our spirit today. Adam did not lose a religion. He lost a government. So if God is restoring, saving us, He is not restoring to you, you to something that you have never been in or been to or been a part of. He is restoring you back to the original intent of His heart and that is what the last Adam came to get back from the first, that the first Adam gave away. Does that make sense? So he's restoring you back to government, not religion. Why? Our services on Sunday mornings many times are religious gatherings. And it's not God. And I only got one shot at you, so I'm going to give it to you. Is that all right? Anytime we in attempt to engage God through a religious structure, God is not obligated to meet up with us. Amen? Why do many people just come to church out of obligation? Because they have been trained to do so ritualistically through religion. <clears throat> and they do not meet God and they do not go home changed. And even the greater, they have not changed the culture or the atmosphere of their city when they came together. Which is the whole reason we assemble together. So Adam did not fall from a religion. He fell from a dominion, a rule. He fell from dominating. He fell from prevailing. He, he fell, excuse me, from kingdom. So when we begin to understand exactly what Adam fell from, we can begin then to begin to understand where God is restoring us to. Does that make sense? Why is this important? Because the creator of a thing, he's the one that has the original intent of its use within him. He takes that original intent, that creative idea, and he puts it in his product. So it can't be gotten from anywhere but the creator of that thing. That's why, how many of y'all got iPhones? Y'all, some of you got Androids, which is another word for demon. I know I'm kidding. In the Greek. No, I'm kidding. This, this iPhone can do so many things that I don't even know it can do. It's probably doing some things I don't want it to do. But that's a whole other sermon. When you got this iPhone and you pulled it out of the box, what was the first thing that you saw when you opened the box? The instruction manual. What does it tell you? Read this manual before operating. Why? 
because the creator wanted of this iPhone wanted to make sure that you understand understood the complete operation of this phone before you tried to operate it. Why? Because they wanted you to get the full value out of the phone that you paid for, but also they didn't want you breaking it. Right? They didn't want you to use it as a coaster or a wedge in the door or a, 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 a projectile coming off the roof of your car or whatever it may be. Uh, yeah. They wanted, and they say if something goes wrong with it, return to, to the manufacturer. Why? Because the manufacturer knows the inward workings of it and they can restore it and send it back to you so it operates as the manufacturer originally intended for it to operate. The phone would be restored or repaired. That's who we are today. When Jesus came and we were born again, he didn't come to get you into heaven. He came to get heaven into earth, but he needed an avenue to be able to do that, and his avenue was man, mankind, the Adamic race. And he put the Adamic race, he put mankind in the earth to rule the earth for him. Not to have a religious presence, because nowhere is it ever mentioned that he wanted a religion. And we'll talk about that here a little bit later, maybe this afternoon. But he wanted a ruler in the earth. He wanted to extend his heavenly government into the earth. Now, one of the ways that I look at this, being a, uh, an American, because we were not raised in a kingdom. We were raised in a, in a, in a constitutional republic with democrat ideas. And uh, whenever we first formed, we were under a crown. We were under King George. And we had colonies. And these colonies all had governors. Am I right? None of the governors came from the colonies. The governors came from England. They were, they were lords or they were part of the king's council. They were people that he trusted. And he put them in these different 13 colonies to govern for the crown, to make sure that the crown's will was done in these 13 colonies that George would never come to. So the same thing, this earth is a colony. We can look at it like that. To where he has put a governor here in the earth. By the matter of fact, that governor is Holy Spirit. But he needed a vessel to operate through governmentally, so he created mankind. Mankind is God's vessel of working and expanding the colony throughout the rest of the earth. We're not to go evangelize in the sense of getting people to heaven, but we're to evangelize in the sense of causing the kingdoms of this world to become the kingdoms of our God. Amen? And it's governmental. It's not religious. I'm going to say that over and over today because you need to hear it. You're going to say, why does he keep saying that? Because I want you to get it in you. I don't want it to be a passing thought. This is a key point <clears throat> to kingdom foundation. Amen? So what God is doing today, or what he did back whenever he died, and he rose again, and he ascended into heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father, he sent the governor back into the earth. You are the governor's mansion. Uh, religious language, sometimes we get all spiritual with it, and we say, well, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We are, but let's bring that into colonization terms you are the governor's mansion. As a matter of fact, there's scripture for that. John chapter 14. I'm going to get in trouble. Go to John 14. Can we just follow what Holy Spirit's wanting to do here? I'm going to get my hard copy out now. I'm going to leave an electronic copy. Y'all need a hard copy. You don't have a hard copy of the Bible. You need one. Look what Jesus said. Red letters. 14, John, verse 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions, the King Jimmy says. Here it says many, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, it, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, religion has taken this thing and twisted it all up 
and made it about you going to heaven. It's not about you going to heaven. If you will study this, again, who's he talking to? What does it mean in their culture? Then how do I apply it to my life? Jesus was telling his disciples here at this point because they had no idea. They, they didn't have a, they, they had no paradigm for a rapture. You could give that paradigm to Darby and Schofield. It's not biblical. I felt the air suck out of the room just a little bit. Whew, come on. Might have been those watching online. They had no, they had no visual at all about him leaving and snatching them out of the earth. Why? Because the culture of that day, that, that they were coming from a Hebrew perspective, not a Western perspective. Amen? So we got to understand that when he's talking to them. And I'm not going to get into eschatology today, even though it would be very, very easy to do. But Jesus was telling them that I'm leaving so that I may prepare you a place of dwelling. Not prepare for you, but to prepare you a dwelling place. Did you catch that? You are the dwelling place. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. There are many mansions. So you're not going to have a, a mansion on a hilltop in glory. You're not even going to have a cabin in the corner of glory land. How many know we live more by the theology of our hymn books than we do the theology of the Bible? Hmm. we got to get away from that. That's Western thinking. That's Greek thought. And we've got to move away from those things. You've got to be careful what you sing. Music is a powerful thing. And when you start singing false doctrine, that false doctrine can get in you. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I fly away. I ain't flying nowhere. Hmm. Yeah. In the sweet by and by. Well, what about the nasty now and now? I need something here. We got it. Holy Spirit has moved back. When Jesus ascended and, and, and he rose from the dead and ascended, we were now eligible again to be the dwelling place of the Spirit of God for the first time since Adam. When Adam sinned, Holy Spirit left. Holy Spirit did not dwell in anyone ever again. He came upon people for tasks. But he did not live in them. Even with John, John in his mother's womb, when she heard the greetings of Mary, it says that John was leaped in the womb and was filled with the Spirit. He was the one. He was the forerunner. It says in Luke chapter 4 that Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. These are the only two at this juncture that we are seeing that are pre-Calvary, that have had the indwelling of Holy Spirit, but then after He rose again, He was sitting at a fish fry with His boys on the beach, and He breathed on them, and He said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? So Holy Spirit was welcome now, not in the sense of please come, but in the legal sense, he now had permission to dwell in men again. Why? Jesus' whole purpose was not to get you into heaven. It was to get Holy Spirit back into the earth. Why? For dominion, for ruling, for kingdom. Not for religious rites, religious rituals, not for you running through, jumping through religious hoops, but for you to get back into a place of being kings in the earth. Come on, smile at me just a little bit. Don't growl, just smile. Amen. Y'all are good. I'm just picking on you. So he says here, let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creep, I mean every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created 
created him male and female, and he created them. God blessed them. In verse 28, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and rada over. Kingdom over the earth. Have dominion over the earth. Rada. Everybody say rada. Very, very important to understand this as, we're, as we are detoxing from religion. Our goal is to rada. Hallelujah. Kingdom. To be kingdom people in the earth. Now, if you notice here, he never told us or gave us permission to rule over one another. It was just over creation. Now, why did, why, why did all this get messed up? It got messed up because Israel wanted a king. God was going to be their king. God was going to be their covering, but they wanted someone else, and they wound up with Moses. We understand that. But we, here's what I want us to grasp today. Adam did not lose a religion. There was no sacrifices in the garden until Adam sinned. And the blood sacrifice was not a religious act. It was an atonement or an appeasement to God until the Lamb of God showed up on the scene to buy back with the currency of heaven, the blood of Jesus, what the first Adam gave away. All right. Go back to 1 John. The purpose here. Sin. It's a singular act of rebellion. It's a singular act of sin or treason. It says here, let me get back there. The one who practices this singular sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared. Everybody say appeared. This word appeared here is the word panero, and it literally means to make visible, to make clear, listen to this, to make manifest, to manifest what's in another's heart. So when it says that he appeared, it doesn't mean he just showed up. This word appeared in the Greek has a purpose tied to it. So he didn't just say, hey guys, here I am. He showed up on assignment. He showed up on assignment to manifest what was in Father's heart. Isn't that good? He didn't show up and say, I'm here to fight the devil. No, he didn't do that. He, he, this word appeared means that when Jesus came into the earth, it was not to do his own will, but his appearance in this Greek word tied into it means I'm, a, I'm showing up to manifest what's in another's heart. Jesus said, I don't do anything unless I've seen the Father do it. I don't say anything unless I've heard the Father say it. I don't go anywhere unless the Father sends me. Amen. Jesus was totally one with the Father. And when he showed up here on the earth, Father already had a plan. From the foundations of the earth, the Word tells us, he had a plan before there was ever a plan needed. Ladies, that's why you're so important. When he, he didn't just create Adam, he created Eve. But he pulled Eve out of Adam. My wife still always tries to get my ribs off my plate. I don't know how to break that. I've tried to bind it, but it don't bind. She reaches for more ribs. <clears throat> Glory. The word woman in Hebrew, it means wombed man. Wombed man. Man with a womb. Not in the definition that you see it today. <clears throat> it means the part of the Adamic race that has a womb or is actually able to bear. <clears throat> now the word womb means matrix. To give birth, to bring something from the unseen into the seen. So before God ever needed a way back in, he created a way back in. Before God ever needed a door, he created a door. He called that door woman. Because he was going to have to get into the earth, back into the earth, in a legal way, not a religious way. 
And the only legal way into the earth and to take back what was getting ready to be given away before it was ever given away was to do it through a man. And the only way to get a man in the earth was through the matrix of a woman, through the womb of a woman, through the door of the womb. So God created the woman and gave her the ability to bear children because there was going to be a day that a little girl from Israel was going to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit to bring a man back into the earth to take back what a man gave away. My Lord, his wisdom in all of this is amazing, isn't it? And he told the snake in the garden, he said, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman's seed. I'm going to make you, you're not going to like each other. You're going to hate one another. Am I right? And he says in there that whenever she brings forth this child, <clears throat> it says there that he said, you will crush his heel but he will crush your head actually it says you will bruise his heel he will crush your head right now that's a very important statement there for you and I why again who's talking who is he talking to what did it mean in that culture and then how do I apply it to my life now we understand Adam didn't write Genesis who wrote Genesis Moses wrote Genesis so Moses is talking to the people of Israel, as God is giving this to him, and he's pulling things out of their culture that makes sense to them so that when Messiah shows up, they'll understand what's going to take place. In the Hebrew culture, the way that you got a baby to breathe when he's born, you hold him by the ankle and you slap the heel and they would, they would pull breath into them. Today we slap the bottom, right? When they come out, we just hit them on the bottom and they scream. In that culture, they held them upside down, they hit the heel, and they would draw breath into them. So he's saying, you're going to bruise his breath. You're going to bruise his life. You'll take it for a moment, but after you've bruised him and taken his breath, he's going to crush your head. Head represents authority. He said, you'll take his life for a moment, but when he has breath back in him, when he, when he draws that breath back into him, he's going to step and crush your head. He was already prophesying about things that were to come in a kingdom perspective. Why? Because the devil was not after a religion. He was after rule, rada. He was not even after worship in the aspect that we look at worship today. People say he was the worship leader in heaven. He was a covering cherub in heaven. We're going to define that here in just a little bit later. So Jesus showed up to manifest what was in another's heart. That another's heart was the Father. <clears throat> so the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy. Everybody say destroy. This word destroy is the word luo, L-U-O in the Greek. Now, Man, I've heard this verse in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8 preached seven ways to Sunday. I grew up in the Baptist church. They preached it, you know, that Jesus came to step on the head of the enemy and to destroy all of the morality that was contrary to heaven in your life. I heard it preached in the Pentecostal churches pretty much the same way, that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He'll deliver you from your sins. He will come and take the drinking out of your life. He'll take the taste of cigarettes out of your mouth. He'll help you, for your wife to stop beating on you, all these types of things. But that's not what he's talking about. This word luo in the Greek, it means this. It means to loose, to release, to untie, to dissolve, or to annul a contract. i got to give that to you again. Listen to this. The word destroy here, it means to loose, to release, to untie, to dissolve, or annul a contract. So when Jesus appeared because of what was in Father's heart, his mission was to loose you, release you, untie you, dissolve, and annul a contract that you'd been tied to from the beginning. 
It takes us all the way back into the garden. God's dealing with a singular sin in the garden that had to do with, with, with kingdom, with ruling, with radah, not religion, not morality, but treason, rebellion. King George tried to put a lot of taxes on us, and we said we've had enough, and we had this thing called the Boston Tea Party. I thought when you're having this tea party in a few weeks, we're going to really do some damage. Woo, that's something prophetic in that. And we said, no, we're not going to be taxed anymore. And actually, the clergy in, this, in these 13 colonies rose up together and began to preach from their pulpits rebellion, treason against the crown. And in doing so, we moved from colonization into statehood. We now have a declaration of independence. It's a good thing in our aspect, but when you're doing it against God, it's not a very good thing. That's exactly what Adam did. He created an atmosphere of independence from God in his act of treason by surrendering his radar to the enemy. So when he's restoring us, He's not restoring us to anything but what the manufacturer originally intended in his heart. Does that make sense? Jesus came to loose, release, you untie, dissolve, and annul a contract that you've been tied to since the beginning. Now let's go look at the next word. It says to destroy the works. Is that word works plural or singular? It appears plural because it has an S on it. Let me give you the definition of the word works here. It's the word ergon or erdu. It means an action, a doing, a labor, a work, or a continual work. Wow. So Jesus appeared with, because Father had something in his heart which was to loose you release you, untie you, dissolve, and annul a contract that started back in the beginning in the garden that continued to work over time until he showed up. So it's not many works, plural. It's one work that continued over time until Jesus showed up. Woo! Glory! That changes things for us. Why? Because he's not trying to get my morality back. He's not trying to get me and you to stop doing immoral things in this capacity. Why? The moral code will be found and learned in the kingdom once you get in the kingdom. So religion has said God wants to deal with your morality, which you cannot change until you're in the kingdom. Religion does not empower you. has no ability to empower you to change your moral code. It will only intensify the immorality. Is this making sense? <clears throat> so when Jesus showed up to loose us, to untie us, to dissolve this and annul this contract that's been working over time from the beginning... You and I are now able to step back into God's original idea, purpose for our life, and that's Rada, kingdom. Everybody say kingdom. <clears throat> As we're looking at this today, we have to understand and go a little bit further. I want us to go to Luke chapter 43. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 4, verse 43. <clears throat> Y'all thought I was writing some new stuff, didn't you? We'll just back up to verse 42. When day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place, <clears throat> and the crowds were searching for him. And they came to him, and they tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said to them, I must preach what? What? Is that what it says? I must preach the 
Oh, we don't have it up there yet, do we? The kingdom of God, not a religion. But he said, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose. Luke chapter 4, verse 43, I was sent for this purpose. It's the kingdom. Everybody say kingdom. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10, Jesus said, whenever you pray, here's how you pray. Our Father who art in heaven. Now let me pause right there for one moment. <clears throat> Every time Jesus talks about the Father, he finds it necessary to give his geographical location. This is very important. My Father who is in heaven. Why is it important that God's in heaven? Because he's establishing the fact for us that God rules in the heavens, but he created men to rule in the earth. <clears throat> the Bible says that God created the heavens for himself, but he created the earth for the sons of men. Amen? Jesus began teaching them, before they really understood everything that was going on, he began to teach them <clears throat> that their positioning was in the earth, not in the heavens. God ruled the heavens, but you and I were called to rule in the earth. So he said, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your what? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He was saying, when you're praying here, pray that there will be a reconnection or a repairing of heaven and earth. Not a repairing in the sense of let's fix it only, but it, I, I saw this prophetically, and it's in the book that we just wrote on the kingdom of the kingdom of uh, the gospel of the kingdom. But when I have a Bluetooth piece in my ear, I have to pair it to this phone for it to work. I saw that so clearly. Jesus is telling us that we've got to be repaired reconnected with heaven in a way that what heaven is desiring here we can begin to manifest but we'll only know it if we're paired to there. Amen? <clears throat> because what's going on in heaven is what God wants to go on in the earth. King George, the crown in England wanted what was happening in England to happen here and wanted what was happening here to feed England. Our crown, the crown of heaven, is wanting to take place in earth things that are going on in heaven right now. But religion says that's impossible. Those things cannot happen. Let me tell you, there's so many things throughout the scripture that show us that God wants things to happen here that is happening there. He has books written about us there. He has books about individuals. He has books about cities. He has books about nations that are written there already that he wants to see manifest here in the earth. Psalms 139 is a good reference for that. Jesus talked about it in Hebrews, or it was prophesied about him in Hebrews, that he may live out the volume of books that are written of him in heaven. Whew, glory to God. So Satan was not after a religion. He was after a ruling. I want you to take your Bibles and go to Luke 4. Luke chapter 4. If you look at verse 1, I quoted that to you a while ago. It says, Jesus, full of Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan where he was baptized, and he was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted of the devil. My Lord. This word tempted here, it is the word trial, but we look at it as test, but it also means to temper. So he wasn't going out there just to be tempted, like, let's see if he can make it. I don't like to call this passage the temptations of Jesus. I like to call it the negotiations. Let me show you why. Look at verse 5. Satan, he led him up, and he showed him all the what? 
Notice it wasn't synagogues, temples, religions. It was kingdoms. It was governments. Now let me stop right there. That word kingdom is plural, and it should be. Why? When God blessed them in verse 28, and He said, Go, be fruitful, multiply, subdue. Subdue is a military word means to conquer and stand on, to subdue something. Don't remove yourself. Once you've conquered it, don't remove yourself. Paul said this, after doing all to stand, stand therefore. Same principle, subduing. Stand in that place. Don't give up the ground. He said subdue and rada, rule. That blessing was on man, but the blessing came with the kingdom. So when Adam gave away... He gave away the blessing. He said, God told Adam to take what he had just given him, this one spot in the earth, and multiply it all around the earth. So Satan had taken that, and he had that ability with it to multiply, to be fruitful, to subdue, to rule. So now there were many kingdoms, many governmental structures that had multiplied around the earth under the, the thumb or the hand of the enemy. So this thing had multiplied. It had grown around. And that's why he says that he showed him all the kingdoms, plural, of the world. Everybody say world. Now, most of the time when you see the word world in the New Testament, it's the word cosmos, <clears throat> which means order, structure, governmental order, governmental structure. So in this particular case, when he uses the word world, it does not mean cosmos. It's not the word cosmos. It's the word, Lord help me say this close to right, oikomene. Oikomene It's where we get the word oikos. Family, to build the family. So this word, world here, it means the inhabitants. It means to dwell. It means family, to build. It means, now look at this. Let me give it to you in the context that the enemy gave it to Jesus. He led him up and showed him all of the kingdoms of his family, of his inheritance. Not the devil's family, Jesus' family. So he brought him up on this high place and he showed him all the kingdoms. He said, hey, I got what belongs to you. Here's all the kingdoms of your family. Here's all of your inheritance that you're supposed to have. Watch this. He showed him all of his family's inheritance, all of his family's kingdoms, in a moment's time, and the devil said unto him, I will give you all of this domain, all of this basilia. I will give you all of this rule, these kingdoms, and its glory. Glory, it means weight and influence. Weight and influence. For it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Did you get that? He took Jesus up to a high place and showed him all the kingdoms of his family at one moment's time. And he said here to him, he said, all of this dominion has been given to me. Where was it given? Back in the garden in the beginning when Adam created treason. He gave it to the enemy and he said, it's been handed over to me and I can give it to whoever I want to. Now why did he offer him kingdoms? Because he knew that he was coming after kingdoms. He was coming after the government, the governments, the rada, the basilia in the Greek that is in the earth. He wasn't coming after a temple. He told them, sitting on the Mount of Olives one day, he told his boys that temple is going to be torn down. Not one stone is going to be left on another. It's going to be plowed over like it never existed. Let me tell you something. It is religion that is saying that temple is going to be built back. It will not be built back. As hard as they try, as much as they want to do, the word of the Lord from Christ himself said it would not be built back. He said, I'll raise it up in three days. 
He was talking about the resurrection, the scripture says, and this being the new temple, this being the dwelling place, this being the governor's mansion where the Holy Spirit's going to live. He said, not in that anymore. It's now moving back into the original residence. How? Oh, that temple that was built by man was nothing more than a holiday inn. A Marriott at best. A temporary dwelling until Holy Spirit could get back home. Woo! Glory to God. It stirs me up every time I talk about it. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He said, I know this belongs to your family, but your boy gave it to me, and I can give it to whoever I want to give it to. Watch this. Here's how he wanted them. Verse 7, Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Powerful statement. We thought Jesus was just pulling a lifesaver <clears throat> out of the scriptures to give him some strength to stand on. No, 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 no. The Bible says it is written. That means it's law. It, here is the legal approach to this, Jesus said. There's only one that I will worship, and, and there's only one that I will serve, and that's my Father. Now look at this. <clears throat> he said, <clears throat> if you will bow down and you will worship me, prosukano, and it literally means to bow or to kneel and kiss the ring. That's what it means, to kiss the ring. Not to kiss the cheek, but to kiss the ring. And the bowing that we see here is not to lay down, but it's literally to kneel with one knee, to take the hand of one, and to kiss the ring. Acknowledging one is Lord over you. Acknowledging another to be king. It's not music. It's not a song. It's a submitting, kneeling, and kissing the hand, the ring of one declaring that he's greater than. That's what was on Satan's bucket list. His whole goal. This whole thing. See, the garden was not an attempt just to take over earth. It was a card to play in the earth for heaven. Because he said, I'm going to exalt my throne above God's throne. I'm going to be like God. It got him the left foot of fellowship. Got him kicked out of heaven, didn't it? So as he, and he was kicked out of heaven into the earth. And the scripture shows us that he, through time, was playing this hand, waiting on Messiah. The Messiah in the Hebrew culture is not a religious leader. He's the anointed one. Anointed one is not a religious term. The word anointed one means the one who is coronated. Yes. Coronated as a king. You don't coronate priests. You coronate kings. So when they say Messiah, anointed one, they're not looking for a religious leader. They are looking for a king. If they're looking for a king, why are we not looking for a king? He said, if you'll bow down and kiss my ring, declare I am Lord, I am the owner, I am the one, then I'll give you everything that you see. I'll give you back all your family stuff. Jesus said, nope, we've already got this thing written out. It's in law. There's only one ring I'm kissing, and that's the ring of my father. There's only one's bidding that I'm doing, and that's the bidding of my father. Is this making sense? And as he began to do that, Satan knew it was he was done. It was over. Jesus said, I'm getting my family's property back, but I'm getting it daddy's way. He's already written law about this and given me legal precedent to be here in the earth to take back the kingdoms of this world. Mm. Hallelujah. So we have to shift structure. We have to shift our mindsets. 
We have to move out of thinking religion. And family, it's hard to do because we've been ingrained in it. But if you do not do it, you will die in your sin. Singular. This is so rich for the earth right now to bring us into our kingship, to bring us into what, is, what was in the Father's heart the entire time before Adam sinned. Before the foundations of the earth, he had already made a way. Let me give you a couple more scriptures and we'll take a break. Let's look at Matthew 6.33. What does he say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. So right now I decree that the spirit of religion that has had us enslaved is being displaced by the foot of the king. Hallelujah! It's being displaced out of our life which means... There's something coming, filling the void after it's there, and it is the footstool of the king. Thank you, Lord. Glory. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. What things? What you're going to eat? What you're going to wear, where you're going to sleep, all the things that are needed in life, it's the king's responsibility to get that to you. Why? A king's worth is gauged by how well his citizens live. Many religion has taught us to go make a living. <laughs> kingdom says go subdue kingdoms. Go, go, go make life. Go release life. You remember Solomon, there's this royal that came to him from Ethiopia, this queen, Sheba. And the scripture shows us, this is amazing to me, when she walked through where the servants were, her knees got weak because of the way they were dressed and the things that they ate off of was better than hers. Let me tell you. It goes on to say in this passage, Solomon was arrayed. Very, very nice. But if he takes care of the grass of the field, how much more is he going to take care of you? This is not something to get you by. God never gives you anything to get you by. He always gives you things to fulfill your assignment. He's interested only in the expansion of his kingdom. That's why religion makes everything about you. So you'll stay inwardly focused. But there's a part of Scripture in Revelation that says that they, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives even unto death. Baby, this ain't about you. God's trying to kill you. He's been trying to kill you since you got born again. What Paul said, it's not me that lives, but it is Christ that lives in me. Right? I'm on assignment now. I'm embodying the King now. The Jesus embodied the Godhead fully. He's living in me. I've got God living in me now, and I am on assignment to cause the kingdoms of this world to become the kingdoms of my God. I'm not trying to get people into heaven. I'm getting people in the kingdom. If you're looking to go to heaven, you're going to be very disappointed because you're not going to stay there very long. You're not going to be a little naked baby floating around on the cloud playing a harp. That's an ugly sight for some of us anyway. Moving on. God didn't need an angel. Whenever you, someone dies, he didn't need another angel. No, 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 no. God gave me a vision some time back, and I was sharing that with uh, uh, Apostle Tony Kemp the other day. And I said, the Lord showed me that whenever that third left, he recreated and replaced them. And through a series of things, Tony said, you're right. Because Tony went to heaven several times and 
got to talk with some folks up there, and that's a whole other story. We'll get him here for y'all one day. The enemy wants you to live out of a mindset of what you don't have. When you're focusing on what you don't have, you might be a Pharisee. Think about it. The enemy wants you to focus on what you don't have, but in the kingdom, God obligates himself by his word to make sure every need that you have for your assignment is fulfilled. Amen. Everything you need. Here's another piece. You can write this down. God's not obligated to answer any prayer that you pray that does not have to do with your assignment. We pray amiss. We're asking for all these things. The scripture says to keep it upon our own lust. We're asking for all these things. We need to reroute our prayers from here to there in the manner of am I praying for my assignment? Why? Because you're a, you are like Jesus. You are on assignment. Every one of you in here has a purpose. You have a destiny. You're not hanging out till Jesus comes. Matter of fact, when he comes, he's going to slip up on us. Hallelujah. When he returns, he is re, there stem, re, is there in front of the word turn again. He's coming back to earth with a new heaven and a new earth being established. And we will rule and reign with him from here. Think about that. Glory, I love this stuff. This is like a kid in a candy shop for me. I love it. It's so liberating. Amen? He's not obligated to answer prayers that you pray that do not have to do with your assignment. What are you assigned to? What is your calling? Who are those in your calling and assignment that he's put in your path to affect and to infect? Hallelujah. Who has he brought into your life to minister to, to help cause them to come into who God has created them to be? The Bible says, no greater love hath any man than this, than he lay down his life for a friend. Can I give you the, 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 the root interpretation of this? You get ready. Here it goes. No greater love hath any man than this, that he lay down his life, his dreams, his visions, his desires to help someone else fulfill theirs. It's not talking about jumping in front of a bus for them. It's talking about laying down everything you know you're called to do to help someone else fulfill what they're called to do. And in doing so, while you're working their field, God's working your field, and you'll wake up one day and find yourself in the fullness of who he called you to be. Wow! Glory! <laughs> Isn't that good? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Take a break. I want you just to pray in the Spirit for just a minute. There's a couple of prophetic words I want to give <clears throat> before we move back into what God's called us here in this teaching. Father, we bless you today. We give you glory for this word. Father, we pray that this word, Lord, just seal it in our, in our heart. Seal it in our DNA by Holy Spirit. Let it just become part of us, part of who we are. And Father, I thank you, Lord, as that begins to happen, Lord, we'll begin to see our DNA shift from a place of wanting to be a sinner, trying to make it to heaven, into kings conquering earth. And We'll go into every sphere of influence that you've called us to go into, and we will see those places become kingdom environments. Hallelujah. Sis, the Lord says over you today that the things that you thought you would have to carry from the past into the future and just have them hanging around are broken off of you today. These things that you thought were scars and these things that you thought were just embedded into your life, God's healing the scars, He's removing the weight, and you're going to begin to run 
with a wind that you've never run with before. And God's going to begin to stir within you when these things are lifted. I declare them lifted off of you and removed out of you even now in Jesus' name. The prophetic is going to go to another level in your life. You're not only going to get a word here and get a word there. You're going to begin to be tuned into the atmosphere of the speaking of God. And you're going to begin to hear what the Lord is saying in a new way. You've been saying, Lord, I just want to know more. I want to hear more. I want to be able to know what you're doing and what you're saying. And the Lord said, I heard you, and now's your day. Hallelujah. And my brother in the pink shirt, the Lord, that's you, yes, sir. The Lord says over you today that you've been around the mountain and you've been through the caves and you've lived by the streams and you've been in places you thought that you would you know, how did I get up? How did I get here? How did I wind up here? The Lord says, I was bringing you through paths that you were picking things up that you will need for this time in the kingdom. For the revelation that God's given you, the things that he's brought you through is for where he is bringing you into. You are a kingdom man. And the Lord says over you today that you are going to begin to have opportunities and you're going to begin to have open doors. But not just that. You're going to have resources to be able to bring what he's put in you, not just through experiences, but what he's deposited in you through revelation and wisdom. This is your day. And the Lord last night said that he's bringing forth those that are not known and some that have been forgotten. And that's you. You are, it seems like at times you were forgotten. And where you'd come from, those that you had run with are doing other things. And you've just kind of been left. The Lord says, I brought you into a new stream for a new river to be formed. And you are a dredging machine within this stream, the Lord says. And you're going to find your place. You're going to find the room of the Lord that he's called you to. And doors are getting ready to swing open. Not just a door, but double doors. God said there are going to be electric doors, doors that before you can even approach, they're going to begin to swing open for you and allow you to step into new places. I speak over the call of God, the fivefold call that is on your life, and I declare it is awakening again. It is being restored. It is being brought back into what God originally intended for you to do. He said he voids nothing even though men void things. He voids nothing. He's just rewiring, recalibrating, and reawakening you for the assignment that is ahead of you to bring the kingdom of God in a greater way. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Mm. The Lord's been watching you. And he says, tell her I'm very happy. And that he's pleased with your heart. And that he's bringing you into a deeper place of intercession and a greater place of alignment even in the house. And the Lord says that as you begin to watch his hand move you, don't resist. Because the temptation is like, oh, oh, Lord, oh, oh, oh. The Lord says, be very pliable in my hand for I'm bringing you into a place of, of being part of a pillar that he is raising up in this house to be able to hold up greater things that he's bringing here. So let him, let him, let him, let him put his hands and begin to remold some things that are there because you're getting ready to see the greatest days that you could ever imagine. And the Lord says, I'm bringing your family with you. I'm bringing them from places of, a, of afar. I want to begin to draw the family, the, the tight-knitness back together for the purpose of kingdom work. Amen? Amen.